Welcome to the Nonprofit Podcast. I'm Kara, fundraising coach here at DonorBox. This is an episode for all you animal lovers out there, and it's a great listen for those of us who have a heart to help others too. I have the honor to have Austin Meadows join me today. Austin is the executive director of For the Love of Alex. I cannot wait to hear more about this unique name for this growing organization, but I can tell you the work they do gives hope to low-income families and their best four-legged friends every day. So welcome, Austin. I am hearing so many great things about all you're doing. Thank you, Kara. I appreciate it. Um, the name Alex. Uh, Alex is uh, the cat of Elizabeth. Elizabeth is the founder of our organization. And back in 2013, when Alex was 10 years old, uh, she noticed that he had some urinating problems and took him to the vet, found out that he had bladder stones and ended up having surgery done to remove those bladder stones. And after he was healing up, she was thinking about, you know, what if I couldn't pay for this? What would have happened? And, and Alex is, you know, probably would have never lived through the ordeal uh, that he had because he had some pretty good sized bladder stones. And so she thought about, you know, people that didn't have money. She was fortunate enough to have the funds to take care of this. So she started uh, uh, For the Love of Alex, uh, made it a 501 3C nonprofit right away. And in 2013, started the organization by herself. And, uh, and the rest is, is history. Unfortunately, Elizabeth uh, became ill in 2017 and she passed away in in 2018. The board uh, brought in a retired uh, business executive to wind down the organization and then disperse the funds to a a like-minded organizations. And while she was going through the paperwork and everything, noticed that uh, there was not a organization similar to ours, or if there were, there were very few and didn't do exactly what we were doing and convinced the board to wind it back up. And uh, 2018, the mid part of 2018, they wound it back up. And then 2019, they brought me into the organization as a operations manager uh, because they were collecting donations through PayPal. And they had an old website that it did its job, but it was dated. So, uh, and they were using a uh, donor management software that they had just gotten uh, that was given a lot of promises, but they never delivered on it. So uh, I built out a HubSpot uh, system for them uh, and customized it to our needs and then uh, uh, built another website. So it was a little bit more dynamic than the previous one. And we started going and did fairly well in 2019. And uh, we were always looking for a platform to do our donations on because with PayPal, we could do PayPal or you could do a a credit card, but it was kind of a clunky uh, path to to go down and wasn't really happy. I had looked at a lot of different platforms and either because of cost or because of features, never really found what we were, were looking for. And then one day out of the blue in 2020, uh, right before COVID hit, uh, I had uh, Jesse Sanchez from uh, DonorBox. And uh, I really liked this one because he did his homework. He knew who I was. He knew who our organization was, what we did, how we did it. And uh, you could tell that he had spent time doing his research. So I said, yep, let's, let's have a meeting. He explained the software. And I'm like, this is what I've been looking for. And we implemented it within probably 14 days or less after that conversation. And then COVID hit strong. That was like April, May. Uh, April, we started the system. And then May, you know, we were all working from home and stuff. And uh, that's, I think, I believe that that's what kept us alive during COVID. And one thing that you mentioned when you were just talking was the consultant found 
that there were no other organizations just like yours. So let's go there for a minute. Um, tell me what makes For the Love of Alex unique. For the Love of Alex funds emergency veterinary care of low-income families. And uh, we pay the veterinarians directly. We do not pay the, uh, the families at all. And for a lot of these pet owners, their pets are their exist or their reason to get up in the morning. And me as a former police officer, I've saw a lot of people in some bad places and they need that drive to keep them going. So, um, and we cover everything, you know, whether it's bladder stones or, you know, whatever the ailment is, and we do it from start to finish, where a lot of organizations will only do a certain species of dog or cat. They'll only do certain ailments, you know, it might be cancer, it might be this, and it's usually just a certain dollar amount. And a lot of those dollar amounts don't even get you in to see a specialist in that particular field of whatever the ailment might be. So that's, that's where she had a hard time finding, you know, a like-minded uh, organization because they don't do start to finish. Well, I see a lot of isolation in this world too, and a lot of mental and physical brokenness mm -hmm. and pets really can help heal that um, for so many people. And their care can come with a hefty price tag, especially when you're faced with trauma or an emergency and low-income families would have to decide, do we pay rent? Do we put food on the table or do we take care of our family pet? And that's where you step in and you have this, you're, you're an animal-based charity, but you also work with the family component too, which is really fabulous. Well, I wanna... the decision even gets worse than that is... When they're at the vet, it's like you either pay or they euthanize the animal. So it, you know, it's financial euthanization. And that's then that sets off a domino effect of mental health and, you know, the well being of the family. We had to, you know, put our pet down and, you know, it's it's not it's not good for the family. Especially if you're in a fragile situation anyway, for sure. Correct. Correct. So let's talk a little bit about those requests. So how do you assess requests for help and who are your beneficiaries? So the process, the process for, for finding the cases, I mean, we don't have a, we don't have a lack of cases. Um, we get literally probably 10 requests a day, every day. So we turn away hundred fold to, compared to what we do. Uh, we do about one case per week. Sometimes we can squeak in a second one. Um, our program manager, Carla, has a background in uh, veterinary care uh, and also uh, the horse indus industry. So she's been with animals, you know, most of her life. Um, and she has her own animal. You know, she has cats, dogs, and horses. Uh, we all all three of us, we're a small team. There's uh, only three of us and we all have a background in with animals. I've had dogs and horses all my life uh, and some cats. And so we evaluate what's, what's the outcome going to be? Is it going to be, you know, is the probability of a good outcome going to happen? Uh, we look at, because there's some cases that we could throw all the money in the world at it and it's just not going to happen. Um, unfortunately. Um, so we look at that, we look at, um, you know, the ability to, that, to get them help as quickly as possible. And then, you know, they have, they have a form that they have to fill out initially. And then once we go through, and a lot of times it it's, has to do with our cash flow. you know, do we have the money to, to initially start this up? And if we have the cash flow and the case looks right, you know, we haven't filled out a second form. And that second form is, you know, doing our due diligence for our donors, the making sure they are low income. And, you know, this isn't someone that's, you know, a breeder that's, you know, just getting animals off the street and trying to 
call them their own and stuff like that. Um, so we, uh, we go through that vetting process and then, you know, we make contact with the vet itself, uh, see if they will take payment from a third party. We've found quite a few veterinarians that will not take payment from a third party. Um, so we pay directly to the vets. So we have to find another veterinarian very quickly to be able to do that. Inspired by our guest? When your supporters feel the same way about your mission, put the power of speedy giving in their hands. DonorBox Text to Give is super easy to set up and lets your supporters give by sending a simple text message from their smartphones. One setup, no forms, no fuss. Ideal for on-the-spot donation drives, church services and conferences, or hassle-free repeat donations. Let the moment move you. DonorBox, helping you help others. So as a follow-up to that question, your beneficiaries, are they local? Are they regional? Is it national or global? Who, who comes to you for help? Our beneficiaries are only in the United States, uh, and they come from all over the United States. You know, Pennsylvania, New York, California, Texas, Florida, Minnesota, you name it, they come from all over. And that's why we receive so many, you know, requests, you know, like I said, over over 10 a day. So let's talk a little bit about your supporters. Um, when For the Love of Alex first got started, your supporter base looked a lot different than it does now. So where were you? Where are you now? And who steps in to make these veterinary uh, care appointments happen? So Elizabeth started on her own by herself, and she used Facebook back when Facebook was a different animal than it is today, back in 2013. And she was able to bring in a lot of people uh, to create her community uh, for the love of Alex. And she put out a monthly or every couple of week email. And uh, she did quite well with that. And that's back when the rules of engagement were much different on Facebook as they are now. Now in 2018, when they restarted for the love of Alex, uh, they were using Facebook and they were using, you know, PayPal. And that was basically it. Uh, and they were putting out emails every once in a while, um, almost weekly. And then today we use multiple social media platforms. We use Facebook, Instagram, and a bunch of others. Two emails a week. Uh, we, When we have a new case, we put out that email talking about this new case. And then we send a second email um, at the end of the week for those that did not donate to that particular case, they get a second email for a second ask. So basically we start off with about 19 to 20,000 emails on, on Tuesday, every Tuesday we send out an email and then the remaining, um, the non-donors get that, not that same email. It's pretty close to the same email, but it's, it's varied a little bit. And, uh, they get that on Friday. So it really still is a lot of grassroots support of people just saying this is an important cause and stepping in to fill that. Oh, absolutely. We, we have people all the time, you know, they'll send five, $10 and they said, sorry. And we're like, no, don't be sorry. I mean, this is what keeps, keeps us moving forward. It's, it's amazing. Uh, we have, we've had some people, we had uh, an older woman that she would send us, you know, she would send us a money order by mail to us once a month, you know, she had to get out of her house, go down to the grocery store, to the post office. And I mean, handwritten every month, you know, and it was, you know, it wasn't a huge amount, but that that's the people that keep us going. You know, it's amazing. And we still have donors still from when Elizabeth started in 2013. You know, and we get new donors, you know, just this past weekend, we had a small local event where we actually got face to face with some people. Uh, we don't get to do those very often, but, you know, we had 50 people that wanted to sign up for our email list. So that's amazing. 
How long does it take to raise the support? So you mentioned you you provide support for roughly one animal a week. How long does it take to raise that support at, to operate at that level? Well, the the cost of the veterinary care varies. I mean, it can be anywhere from a thousand dollars to we've had some over ten thousand um, dollars. The ones that have good outcomes, you know, because we're getting better and better at able to screen these these things. Um, you know, they're you're looking from fifteen hundred to twenty five hundred dollars per case. You know, which that's a lot of money, and uh, we are able to usually get those cases, the veterinary costs at least covered within one to two weeks. So, I mean, some of them are still perpetually being paid on by, you know, from donors that were earlier in the year or even from last year, you know, because we, you know, went in the hole a little bit on them. Uh, But for the most part, about one to two weeks to get the veterinary costs done. Now, there's the other costs of nonprofit that a lot of people don't understand or don't see, you know, like all the software we have to, to run all this stuff cost money. Um, state registrations, we're a national nonprofit. So we have to register, I believe it's 40 states now that are, have some form of state registration and, and able to, to enable you to solicit within that state. And that runs up quite a bit of money, you know, not only for the state registration, you know, some state it's, kind of funny state registrations it could be tons and tons of paperwork and then you know a twenty dollar fee or it could be you know a thousand dollar fee and one piece of paper so i mean there's no rhyme or reason how each state does it but it gets very expensive uh we do use a service for it because it's very confusing because every state changes their rules every year uh just in 2019 there was only 30 two or 36 states that did it now there's 40 maybe more now so it you know you have a fee for that you have a fee for this you know it gets the overhead is very you know costs a lot the cost of raising money the cost of doing business business yeah and a lot and a lot of donors don't understand that you know they don't understand that the cost of doing business well you're a nonprofit. you're not a business but it is what it is you know well and the cost to run a sophisticated nonprofit has a lot of those costs and fees and it's hard to garner that donor support without being a sophisticated organization you know to to really prove that you're doing things so last week i heard the news that uh, you lost alex the namesake of the organization for the love of alex so please accept our condolences on that recent loss you're at a pivotal point in your organization um you Elizabeth passed away several years ago. You've been able to carry on her legacy. And now how do you keep both Alex's and Elizabeth's legacies alive and move the organization forward? We, um, well, thank you. First off, thank you. Uh, Alex was 19 years old. Uh, We believe he had some type of a CVA uh, stroke. Um, He was... He was a very healthy and happy animal up until his last day. Uh, I I had seen him actually the the Thursday before uh, he passed and was very, seemed in very good spirits. You you couldn't, there was no precursor to his, his, uh, his demise at all. So it happened very quickly. Um, we keep Elizabeth's and Alex's. I mean, we talk about them constantly. They are, you know, they are our mascot and char- or character of our organization. You know, uh, and we celebrate uh, Elizabeth's birthday every year. Um, we celebrate Alex's birthday every year, and we will continue to do that and move forward and just try and. We always try and push to do more cases. Every week, you know, we just like, can we squeak another one out? Can we, or can we help someone else? And so I think that's, and we'll never change the name. So I think that's what'll keep it, keep it going. I love that. 
And you've inspired me to, we lost our beloved Reggie, our family dog. Um, and we've been looking for a way to honor him. So I think I'll be sending um, a donation in his memory to your organization. I just, I love the, what you stand for. Thank you. Austin, I've really enjoyed our time today. Uh, thank you very much for helping me learn and understand more about your mission. But before we leave, do you have any inspiration you can share? Maybe a story of something really great that's happened recently. Sure. Inspiration wise that I, you know, tell other nonprofits because they'll ask it's like, oh, I want to start a nonprofit. What do I do? It's like build a team of people that have skill sets. Um, I, I could never do this job alone and Carla can't do her job alone and Holly can't do her job alone. Uh, we have a really good team. We have really good skill sets So build a team with skill sets and just say yes to to everything when it comes to, to the marketing side of your organization. And with that being said, we, at the end of uh, 2021, we had our end of year campaign and we were squeaking it out financially. And, you know, there's the, it's like, are, are we going to make enough to make it through the, to the next year, you know? And uh, we had donors donating, you know, at a pretty rapid rate. It was right around, right after Christmas, you know, people trying to get in before the end of the year. And we had a donation for $6,000. And was like, wow, that's really great. We normally, we don't get donations that big. And I asked uh, Carla, our program manager, I said, can you reach out to them? Make sure it's not a mistake. Because we've had that happen in the past. They add an extra zero and, or two zeros. <laughs> and it gets out of control for them, you know, and they don't even realize it happened. And uh, so 15 minutes later, she calls back and she says, yeah, it was a mistake. It was supposed to be $30,000. And I'm like, what? Uh, here, there's an organization that uh, their business, they, at the beginning of the year, they said, we want to give 1% of our profits to nonprofit organizations. And we were one of three nonprofits that received money from them and how they found out about us was uh, the employees had to submit organizations to donate to and then they would vote or you know discuss those organizations and they found us in a blog about the top 15 animal nonprofits and that blog was written by DonorBox and that's how they found us. And the reason they liked it, it wasn't just about animals. It was about people. And they voted on it. And we got $30,000 out of it. What a gift. What yes, a it gift. was. That's an amazing story. Thank you for that. And, and, and I love that you, that you do just link that human component with the animal component. Because so many of our relationships in our families do have that animal component and it really is beautiful. Well, what I think is really great is that For the Love of Alex financially supports animals and pets in life-threatening conditions, but even more, they and their supporters give families dignity by offering choices when they may not otherwise have a choice. And with that, they provide a glimmer of hope and help battle isolation too. And that's what the nonprofit podcast is all about staying in touch with the impact of the work of so many great organizations around the world. Connecting with on the ground results can be challenging, which is why we are here with a new, inspiring, informative, and always interesting interview every Thursday. So follow, rate, and download the nonprofit podcast today and join us next time. Until then, stay inspired. The Nonprofit Podcast, powered by DonorBox helping you help others.